Okay. Um, hello. I am here to talk to you about um, a project that's actually been going on a long time, so it's very flattering to be put in something called Innovative Editions because this is something that I've been doing for quite a while and some of you have probably heard about. But I'll, I'll start my story by picking on someone else here. I was at the poster session on uh, Wednesday and I found this poster that talked about having a blueprint for research data reuse. And I see this sort of thing all the time. You have to record the data in a structured form with an accessible API, create a lightweight ontology that contains the rules and definitions of the data model, transform the structured data to RDF following the rules from the ontology, and okay, you know, um, next step is, is profit and all of that. But this is where I always get stuck. Because on the one hand, I could have a lightweight ontology. On the other hand, it could express the rules and definitions of the data model. These two things do not necessarily go together. And I'm going to illustrate this with the project that I've been working on, which is um, STEMARES. This is a Neo4j based repository for variant text. Um, it's the data storage software behind StemaWeb, which is the service that um, some people have heard of. StemaWeb started as a project in 2010, and its central model is the idea of the variant graph or the collation graph. And we, had, we made a switch in about 2015 from a Perl backend to a Neo4j backend. Um, and so I will start the presentation by kind of walking you through what the data model is, and then I'm going to be talking about my attempts to be a team player and try and make an ontology like everyone tells me I should do finally after all these years and what came of it. So the SEMARES model, we start with, I'm not going to say a text, I'm going to say a tradition because that way I don't have to say text. Um, the tradition is kind of the, the thing that, you know, the, the what all of those manuscripts with all of those different copies, what they actually carry and what you're actually trying, you know, what you, the thing that you're trying to produce in addition of. So the tradition can have parts or sections. These are the turquoise nodes here. The sections generally have some published order, but we also have to pay attention to the fact that different manuscripts might carry the sections in different orders. And so we have a way to deal with that in the data model too, with the links between um, between the sections. So each of our sections can contain a collation. This is, this is all the way back from the original STEM web. Every collation has a beginning and an end. Collations are made of readings and readings are arranged in sequences. Now, I don't mind if your reading is a word or a sentence or half a word or a paragraph. Um, it depends on the context and it depends on, it depends on what exactly you need to collate with what other thing, but I am completely agnostic as to, you know, what your reading actually contains. And we have operations in the data model that you can, you can join readings together, you can split readings apart, you can decide that these two witnesses, these two readings, they actually are the same reading and they should go together. You can actually also decide to undo that and split them apart again in that way. Um, and variant reading, and I'm going to get to a, a better picture of this in a minute, variant readings are often related to each other somehow. And you, you often, you know, you want to say, well, this is a spelling variant of this other reading, or this is a grammatical variant, or these things are synonyms or whatever. And so these relations can be defined in the data model and be given properties. You can say that, you know, this relation only makes sense for co-located readings. You can't say that, you know, these two things are you know, this is a spelling variant of this other thing. You're not going to put it in an apparatus if it's not actually in the same place in the text. That's the idea. Um, you, we can have implicit hierarchies in the relations. So we can say that, well, if these two things are related by spelling and this one, you know, A and B are related by spelling and B and C are related by, um, also by, no, by, by grammar, then that implies that A and C are also related by grammar. So we can have this kind of hierarchy and we can also have transitivity that, um, you know, if these two are spelling variants and this one is also a spelling variant of one, then it's also a spelling variant of the other. Here's the prettier picture I was um, promising. This is, what, this is what the collation graph looks like when users actually work with it, as opposed to when I'm just making a view of it in the Neo4j visualization schema. 
Um, you can also have specializations of sequences to indicate, for example, what the lemma path through the collation graph is, or what the, um, where emendations can be incorporated into the graph. These are all things in the data model. So in these black nodes are all sequence relations. I don't have, and the red nodes are related, um, related readings. And I don't have a picture of it here, but um, there are some versions where some of these nodes are red, which indicates that they are the lemma text, and then you will have a red series of arrows going through them to indicate, you know, this is the, the edited text that we are establishing. Now, the starting at the top again, a tradition also has a number of witnesses. And the witnesses are what contain the readings. Um, in the graph, the sigla are properties on the reading sequences. Um, witnesses can be configured into a stemma, and a tradition can have as many semata as you like. A semata starts with an archetype. The archetype transmits the text to other witnesses. An important thing here is that we distinguish between lost witnesses, hypothetical witnesses, and extant witnesses, and we make it, we make the rule in our data model that, for example, hypothetical witnesses can only belong to the one stemma where they are defined. They do not necessarily, they don't belong to the tradition because they are not a real witness of the tradition. They're just this hypothetical construct. They only belong to the one stemma, and they can't belong to multiple stemmata in the same, for the same tradition, because if I draw a stemma and I put beta on one of the intermediate nodes, and you draw a stemma and you put beta on another intermediate node, our betas are not the same. And I'm not, and so this is, this is one of the, um, this is one of the constraints we have. So why am I using Neo4j for this? Because um, Neo4j has a lot of facilities. It has, it has this thing called the traversal framework. It means that it is an easy and cheap operation to crawl the graph to, example, to, for example, pick out the text sequence of a particular witness, or to pick out, or to go through, go through the entire graph setting ranks on the nodes. And ranks are very important for telling whether two readings are in the same place or not. And also for operations like, if two readings are not in the same place, but they topologically could be in the same place, then we need to allow making a relation there. This is quite a quite a complicated mathematical operation, but Neo4j handles it very efficiently, and this is one of the primary reasons I use it. Um, and also, another thing that we can do with Neo4j is to use the traversal framework to create a kind of temper. So for example, if I say, I want to see a version of the collation where I'm not bothered by the spelling variants and I want to normalize with all of, this, you know, with all of the spelling variants compressed down to one node, I can use the traversal framework to create a kind of temporary shadow graph that is the normalized graph, and then when I'm done with it, I can take it away again, because this is something that gets calculated on the fly every time a user needs it. Okay, so this brings me to, so I wanted to give that model of what the Stemma Web um, model looks like. And so some time ago, because of all of this discussion of ontologies and linked open data and all of that stuff, I thought, well, shouldn't I be making an ontology for STEM arrest? So one of the tricky things, well, I mean, to, to sort of make the framework, STEM arrest is a property graph. This means that there are properties on nodes, but there are also properties on edges. This makes it a little bit tricky to make an ontology, as we will see. Um, Another reason why people talk about making ontologies is for compatibility with other vocabularies. Um, this is not an XML-based model. Many of its concepts are easily transferred to TEI-based models, and we do have a facility for exporting a TEI view, a TEI version of a text in the graph. Um, so far, the validation has been entirely in the program logic. Uh, and this is fine for what it is, because I have some complex rules, but on the other hand, if we want to have 
interoperability and other people understanding my data model, they shouldn't really have to read the Java code, maybe? You know, just a thought. So, you know, how can I express the rules of this data model without my Java code? And this is kind of summing up, you know, my basic problem here. So, I have the desire to express the data model in a formal way, as independently as possible from the code that I wrote. It's also a good means of finding my, some of my own software bugs, because you know I have, what, 287 tests in the Stemma Rev Suite. They can all pass, and when I start this project, I run into validation errors. Oopsie. So clearly, you know, even with 287 tests, I'm not catching everything, and this is another reason that validation is important to me. Uh, this can also be illustrated. I'll tell a story. In my first version of Stemma Web, you couldn't do, I, ha I had a website, it had users, but I couldn't let users delete their traditions. And the reason I couldn't let users delete their traditions was because at some point, I tried deleting a tradition and it corrupted the entire database. It killed, like, you know, not, not every, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't kill every text in the, in the database, every tradition in the database, but it killed, you know, some completely arbitrary subset of traditions that had nothing to do with the, ones, with the one that I was trying to delete. And so I got very paranoid about this because when you have users who are depending on your software, who, are, who have put their trust for some inexplicable reason in you to have your website help them do their scholarly work, you don't want to just suddenly say, oh, sorry, I deleted your data can't get it back. All those, all those weeks of work you did, sorry. Well, you know, that doesn't make people happy, right? So um, I have ever since been very paranoid about making sure that I don't make mistakes in my coding that might cause some kind of disaster like that. Now, in the current version of Stemma Web, you can delete a tradition. And the model that I have to adopt so that you can delete a tradition is that I start from the tradition node, I crawl the graph outwards, and I have to be pretty darn sure that if I'm crawling the graph outwards, none of the things that I touch are going to touch anyone else's tradition. This is a really, really important constraint for me. So, now, coming back to making the ontology, fortunately, um, graph-based models do lend themselves pretty easily to formalization. I have my Neo4j labels that can be classes. I can have my relationship types that are object properties, and I have data properties, which are the node properties. Not able yet to deal with the edge properties. Um, I'll come back to that. And one thing I get and one thing that I was able to do in the ontology, which I was never able to do in Neo4j, was the concept of subclassing. Uh, subclassing turns out to be, you know, quite a useful construct. I have special types of readings. Um, in, the, in the Neo4j data model, I have to indicate that there are special types of readings by some, you know, Boolean flag or by an extra label or something like that. But in, you know, in OWL, I can make a subclass, and that kind of makes my life a bit easier, actually. So the, on, I'll, I'll have a link at the end where you can look at the ontology itself, but you know, many of these classes, uh, many of these classes that come from my uh, Stemma Web, Stemma REST model have corresponding DEI vocabulary elements. Other classes don't. Um, Stemata can be expressed as graphs. TEI has a way to do this, but there's also a much more generic way to do this called GraphML. So, you know, either one could work. Um, there are some properties that are implied by placement in an XML document rather than having any, having any actual vocabulary, which are always going to be explicit in any kind of graph model, including RDF and linked open data. And here I had to make some terms. Um, I have noticed that there are other ontologies cropping up. I, I found, you know, I, I read some time ago about the critical apparatus ontology, which was um, I think Francesca Giovanetti um, proposed this, and I found that kind of interesting because a lot of her vocabulary could probably be expressed compatibly with my idea of a relation type, of this, you know, re relation between readings. And so that will be a fun thing to do if, if um, you know, uh, if, we, if we ever get that far. 
So that's fine. But now the problem. Um, first of all, the ontology has an open world assumption, which makes validation not, its, not exactly its forte. Second of all, of course, I don't have edge properties. Now, I was able to get rid of some of the edge properties with subclasses, but in other cases, I really can't find a way to do without the edge. Actually, I did find a way to do without the edge properties, and I'll show you, but it's ugly. And most importantly, I couldn't enforce my, I couldn't enforce my do not kill the database restriction. There's no way to say in an ontology that if a, if a witness belongs to a stemma and the witness belongs to a tradition, the stemma has to belong to the same tradition. I couldn't find a way to do that now. Um, because, you know, it's good at classes. It's not so good at, you know, individuals, as it were. And, and you know, mixing classes and individuals in its, in its restriction statements. Um, another nice one was that I wanted to say that an end reading has to have the highest node rank and be at the end of all possible witness paths. I can check this in Java. It's not the sort of thing that OWL will validate for me. Okay. But then I came in 2020 or 2021, there's a proposal called RDS star. This is about having triples, linked open data triples, as subjects or objects of other triples, which is cool because that kind of solves my property graph problem in that, you know, I can now have properties of, well, not exactly properties of properties, but certainly properties of triples, which amounts to the same thing. Um, but the really interesting thing was that the, um, yeah, so, so yeah, the, I forget I said that. RDS star is still in its infancy, but it's increasingly supported by existing software. GraphDB supports it, Apache Yana supports it, Neo4j has a plugin called NeoSemantics, which supports it. Um, it's still somewhat controversial because a lot of RDS people will say, well, if you need, if you need triple reification, then you're probably doing your data model wrong. Um, and, you know, you could say this. Here's my, here's an example of my data model. This is the reading sequences with the witnesses marked on them. Um, and you can see that witnesses A, B, and C say the black cat, and witness D says the white cat, and I say, oh yes, these are, this is related with a, with a type of an antonym and so on. I could do this with normal old reification. It would be that complicated. It would double the number of, um, it would double the number of um, edges in the graph. It would something like double the number of um, nodes in the graph. And the problem here is that, you know, uh, I don't have a slide about this, but when I made the OWL ontology and I validated one of my test traditions against it, then it went fine. And then I validated my real tradition. I work on the, the Armenian Chronicle of Matthew of Edessa, and it's quite long, and we've got a lot of sections and a lot of data in the database. And I started off the, ontology, the OWL validation um, one evening, and I woke up the next morning, and it wasn't done yet. And I finally had to kill it because I didn't know when it was going to finish or how long it was going to take. And I have to say that my, um, my computer at home has, you know, 64 gigs of memory and, you know, <laughs> lots of power. And it was still taking, you know, it still didn't finish overnight to validate this ontology. So this is kind of a problem. And this brings me to my next, um, my next secret weapon, which is Shackle. This is a solution for validation that was recommended in July 2017. So it's a bit older than RDS star. Um, here you can define shapes against which a data graph can be validated. And Shackle is actually meant for validation in a way that OWL kind of is, kind of isn't. Um, you, can, you can actually specify that, you know, these shapes are closed. This, and I know you can do closed world validation with OWL, but it wasn't really designed for it, and Shackle was. And um, Shackle is increasingly supported by existing software. It's supported entirely by Apache Yena. It's supported partially by anything that uses RDF4J, including GraphDB or NeoSemantics. And the really interesting thing for me with Shackle is that you can define your constraints with Sparkle, which is really cool. And also really, you know, one of my, one of my favorite things about this is um, how to, um, 
is thinking about how we always tell ourselves that we have to separate the data from the program logic. And now in my validation file, which is kind of like data, which will be saved with the rest of the data, I have program logic because I'm programming Shackle in it. So I'm kind of blurring this boundary. And it's, it's possibly problematic, but also really fun. So this is an example of a Shackle programmatic constraint definition. Um, and you know, here I have code in my data. And you know, this is something that is necessarily now increasingly supported by the standard, which I quite like. So this is my, I have to rush here, but essentially what I found is that you know, in practical experience, I'm not quite there yet. I don't yet have the perfect solution because um, RDF star and Shackle don't yet play together. Um, Shackle overlaps with OWL constraints, but doesn't entirely understand subclasses, for example. Um, and so this is my, um, you know, this is where I am with that. So, um, so this is, this is the current state of things. These are my constraints, and this is why I don't have a complete solution for validating similar web graphs just yet when getting completely rid of the Java code I had. Or for, for all of this validation. But this is basically my pipeline. I start with the OWL ontology and the RDF star expression of the data. I use the ontology to validate everything except the reified triples. I generate the graph with the OWL inferences, and then I can take my shackle shape file, and I can put that through the shackle, the shackle validator. And so there I, there I am, I'm actually doing OWL inferencing in order to do this job. So there, there you are, I'm finally using some of the logic. And then, I am more in line with digital humanities standards. Thanks for your attention. You can have a look at the code there.